Welcome everybody to Dead Talk Live and tonight we have the director of the newly released Studio 666, BJ McDonald with us. BJ, thank you for being here. How you doing, man? Thanks for having me. I'm doing great. Yeah, yeah. just hanging out and it's great. crazy times. <laughs> it's great to have you back and for our audience, Studio 666 uh, is newly released and it's exclusively only available in theaters and before we get to the movie i want to ask you about that because no more than a few months ago i was writing the movie theater obituary myself but then yeah. spider-man came along it blew past the one billion dollar mark so in today's in today in the present day what is your outlook on the future of movie theaters do you think they're coming back now I hope so. I mean, honestly, I love still love going to the movies, you know, I mean, I mean, times have been weird with COVID and people are still a bit iffy about going out and going to theaters for the most part. Um, but I've seen a lot, you know, it's like it's, the crowds aren't as much, but I really hope that theaters last because there's nothing like going to a theater and sitting with a crowd that's having fun, that's enjoying the movie. There's like an energy about it that, yeah. that you don't get at home unless no. you have like all your friends over. But you know, I, I hope the theaters do stay around. I don't think they're going to go anywhere. I really hope they don't. But, you know, it'd be a shame to lose the theater experience. It'd be a shame to, like, lose that whole, like, community getting together, everybody going together to watch a movie and have a good yeah. time. And I like I said, I was writing the obituary myself and preaching it to my audience. But then Spider-Man, man, it just, it was like the old times. It yeah, just right? blew, broke every record, blew through the $1 billion mark within several days. So when yeah. you found out that, well, first off, when did you find out that Studio 666 is going to have an exclusive theatrical release? We found out after we were done with everything and when Open Road bought the movie. Uh, like, we honestly didn't think it was, we never we never imagined this movie was going to go to theaters, honestly. Um, we were just, we made this movie because we were just, you know, for the love of horror, for the love of, like, the old band movies and comedies. You know, we just were having a good time with it and trying to do something around that. And then when we got the word that there was going to theaters, we were, me and Dave and the guys were kind of like, oh, oh, wow. OK, cool. I mean, <laughs> and Open Road's a great studio, but it's like, you know, the, it's 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 a smaller studio. So mm -hmm. you're not getting as much backing as, say, like, you know, Warner Brothers putting out a big movie or like the Marvel Universe putting out things like that. So we were really lucky to actually get a theatrical release. You know, I'm really happy that people braved the theaters to actually go out and see um, our, our little horror film that we did, you know, that actually is a little, you know. And it's in, wildly in, in, in entertaining. I watched it, I finished it today, like I was telling BJ before we went live, this movie is, for horror fans out there, you'll love it. Uh, so there was a lot of secrecy surrounding Studio 666. Why was that? Uh, and when the announcement was made, it surprised a lot of people. Uh, <laughs> Dave Grohl, the Foo Fighters in the movie, what's going on? So what what was the deal behind all the secrecy? When we started making the movie, it was just we didn't want anyone really knowing what we were doing. We didn't want anyone knowing that the Foo Fighters were making a horror film because honestly, it's pretty ridiculous. Let's be honest. It's crazy. Like, <laughs> And we knew that. We were like, okay, in order to make this really work, we need to make sure that we kind of keep this under wraps. And like, when we decide that we're going to tell the world that we have it done, it's going to be a total shocker to people. You know, they're going to be like, okay, like, and that's kind of what happened when we revealed it. it was like people were like wait a second th what is this real is this like a fake trailer what's going on but I, now we we want it was it was all planned it was all the element of surprise it was all like trying to keep it under wraps so you know it could be a special thing and it worked it really worked because if you go out there and you talk to horror and non-horror fans they know that dave Grohl, the foo fighters are in this new movie even if they're not horror fans they know yeah. that dave Grohl is and the foo fighters are in this new movie and they're like is that a joke is that really is yeah. it really there uh so did you guys take any kind of special precautions while you were filming to make sure that it did not leak you know that's the thing when you're getting a crew together and everybody signs ndas and we basically told everybody look you know it's we're 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 all lucky to be here working on this project so let's keep it you know as a very quiet you know thing let's try to keep it all you know all under wraps and the crew you know because the crew's all professional crews they they we sign ndas all the time mm -hmm. um and so they know but it was just for the love of everybody coming together and making this movie really happen and uh everybody wanted to be as special as possible and not like really let it leak out at all and like 
you know, do what we did. Like, just yeah. be like, and here's this crazy poster that we first showed. And people are like, wait, it's what? And it's like, <laughs> okay. And then the trailer comes out and it's like total surprise. Um, so yeah, the crew and everybody, you know, I wanted to talk about it for the longest time, but you know, obviously you, know, you, you don't want to be the, lip. yeah, you got to bite your lip in as the director. You, you don't want to be the one that blows the whistle. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about how this movie came to you to direct. First off, do you did you know Dave Grohl before this? Did you guys have a relationship? Uh, how did how did this movie come your way to direct? It's funny because like it's their tour manager is a guy named Gus Brandt. He grew up in my hometown in Pensacola, Florida, where I used to be in a punk band, and Gus used to book my punk band for all these opening bands that would come through back in the nineties. Yeah. Um, all of a sudden, Gus took off and became the Foo Fighters tour manager. So I was, I was like, "Oh, that's cool." You know, next thing I know, cut years later, I'm, I'm, you know, I see Gus in Atlanta, and he brings me in. And I get to, I get to watch the Foo Fighters backstage, and kind of that's this is really cool, you know, seeing all that stuff. And didn't really meet the guys then either. Then I did uh, Brandon Trost, a buddy of mine who's a cinematographer. He, uh, he did the Run music video, and he brought me in to do that video with them. Mm-hmm. And I got to meet Dave and work with Dave on that. Then cut to Dave doing Medicine at Midnight, and he goes to two of the producers that he works with, uh, Jim Rhoda and John Ramsey, um, who did Sonic Highways and Sound City uh, and a bunch of those, a, a bunch of his other, you know, the band videos. Mm-hmm. He goes, "Hey, I have this idea. You know, I want to do a horror film, and and uh, you know, we need to find a director." And they're like, "Oh, you should you should call our buddy BJ. You know, like you know, he did all the Slayer videos, and you know, and Dave knew about those. He's like, oh, awesome. So he wrote the, you know, he had the pitch. They sent it to me." I took that pitch. I wrote kind of like what I thought would be cool to add to like his pitch, uh, wrote a whole lookbook with pictures and everything, like just like a, a presentation. We had a meeting. We, you know, I, I presented all my ideas. I presented the lookbook of what I thought it should look like. We talked about directors. We talked about, you know, the way it should look, the tone and the vibe of the film, mm-hmm. being a band, making a band movie first, making a comedy, but also infusing it with the horror. That's what, what, what I, I came in for. Um, and, uh, we just hit it off and that was it. You know, a lot of mutual friends. And then I saw Gus going back to Gus. Gus showed up. I'm like, dude, what's up? <laughs> Directing this movie. <laughs> so is Dave Grohl a horror fan? Yeah. I mean, he definitely knows his horror stuff. Like we talked about all sorts of movies, you know, he, he loves the exorcist, you know, evil dead movies. He was totally into those things. And, you know, the John Carpenter stuff, especially we talked a lot about that because we had both had inspiration of, of growing up, you know, with the John Carpenter films. So yeah, he definitely is a horror fan. He knew what we were doing. Yeah, I don't want to spoil the. Okay, I, I'll just keep yeah. my mouth shut. Yeah. Now, um, everyone looked like they had a blast. So when you were having these meetings and you met with Dave and you got to meet the rest of the band and you started shooting, what was it like? These, I mean, they're not. This is not their main career. Uh, they're not right. actors. Okay. Uh, so exactly. did. It, were you surprised on how well they adapted to being in front of the camera? Was it challenging for you? No, I mean, honestly, it wasn't challenging at all. Like, cause I was just, my whole goal, look, when we went into it, we were like not knowing what we were going to do actor, like acting wise, how it was going to be when we were in pre-pro, but we always made a joke about it saying, look, dude, all the other band movies, the acting's not that great anyways. And we always thought it'd be funny. And it was a play on that. We were like, hey, if it's bad acting, who cares? That's what these old movies kind of throw in. That's like what they're doing. So it's it's kind of the perfect combo. I actually was surprised with them when they came in, you know, because they they took it as serious. They took it very serious. They came in, they, and they you know, never late, which, you know, they're rock stars. So it's yeah. like, they're, they're actually on time every time. Yeah. That's crazy. Um, how lucky are we? Yeah, but they came in and like, totally kicked ass and you know we we would talk about the scenes we'd talk about what happened before that day's scene so they could kind of get into the mode the mode and 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 their their character which is themselves you know and i thought they did a killer job like i couldn't ask for better people like to work they were great i thought they were just really great i love the satire that you put into the that was put into the film with dave and this image that we have of rock stars being prima donnas (laughs) showing up the world revolves around them and then we see dave totally into character which like you said is himself but not himself i'm a rock star and he's just losing (laughs) it going over this demonic possession 
did you guys have like specific discussions that you guys you wanted to push that satire, that stereotype, and really push it to the limit? Yeah, I mean, everybody knows Dave Grohl is like the nicest guy in rock and roll, and it's like completely one hundred percent true. <clears throat> he, you know, he's it was it's fun to actually, especially for the Foo Fighters fans, to see bad Dave, yeah. evil Dave. You know, and that was kind of another reason why we went we took that that course is because it is like we wanted to do everything that was kind of like not what you would expect and 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 make it that way and 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 that yeah we we definitely played up on that whole bit quite a lot. So, it's funny because like Dave Kenny, like he's he's such a nice guy, like. Tony Gardner had to like make prosthetic eyebrows that like would frown because he, he he can't really frown like or can't look like do like Ur, like that. <laughs> so do he that had to mean make like it's really funny. Yeah. So for for people nice. who, who don't know, like you, you said a little while ago, it's Dave's story, and he, he had two other writers write the screenplay. Yeah. Uh, so when it came time to film, was he very possessive of the story? and how he wanted it told or once you guys got on set you had the reins and he was hands off when it no, came. He, wanted, he wanted to basically uh sorry for cutting you off there no it's okay. uh, no he he basically um he is it, his story you know and and he gave the pitch to them and also with the things that i improved on uh with for, with the backstory of the house and stuff and then we gave it to the writers the writers did the thing and we read it a couple times, kind of went back and forth on, on some things that we were like, ah, we probably shouldn't have that or this or that. Dave was very in control of like what the story is. You know, it, it was, he, it's his idea, story mm -hmm. by, and so he was. But literally when we got on set, you know, he, he wasn't like, he was all for just trying all sorts of funny ideas or like saying things that are totally off off script. And and we, we did a lot of improv in this movie too, which is like, you know, letting the guys riff instead of just like having to memorize lines. Cause I don't think they would ever memorize lines. I don't think Taylor ever read the script from what I'm hearing. <laughs> um, and, but he'd still like would get what we were doing. And, you know, I would throw out lines or like what he would have to say to make sure we're doing it. But uh, it was, it was more fun that way. Yeah. You know, let the guys be themselves, you know, because that's who we're, we're dealing, we're dealing with the Foo Fighters. They should play the Foo Fighters. And once you start watching this film, you very quickly forget you are watching a legendary rock band, but mm -hmm. you start getting the feel that you're watching a garage band trying to get their career started because right. they're just a bunch of normal guys, you know, they're, they're busting on each other and yeah. you know you forget that these are i mean they're legends and they've been around for 30 plus years um and you just see them as a band trying to get a start and you see them as normal people did yep. that sort of fall into place naturally or was that sort of choreographed in some way we, we kind of choreographed it a bit because actually the script we made sure that each in, in the script that the that the characters of themselves were actually true to kind of how they really are mm -hmm. so it was written uh actually to like so rami's characters that's rami like when you see rami that's rami <laughs> like he's he's very much that guy pat's pat you know taylor's taylor and it really you know we wanted to capture and make sure that everybody felt like you know like uh, when a when a crowd leaves the theater or whenever they see it you know however they see it later on um it's kind of fun to actually immerse yourself and feel like you're sitting there in a band practice and you're really like meeting these guys and seeing who they all really are you know yeah. they all have a, they all have a piece in, of, of themselves in this film that, that you know people now can relate to because they're playing themselves and it's kind of we kind of wanted that and you hit it you nailed it right there and pat smear uh was very entertaining to watch uh he's, he's a he's fun, funny guy <laughs> he's just is he just naturally funny as a person not acting or anything He's hilarious. Like he's he's so awesome when he comes in. It's just funny because like you're you're like, all right, Pat, I need you to scream. He's like, okay. Ah! And then he starts like screaming and going crazy and like doing his thing. And then he's like, is that okay? You know, he's like he's so like chill. And you're like, yeah, no, you did great, Pat. You're you're fantastic. You know, he's just he, he, that's Pat. He's great. His character. Like, I, I, thanks. <laughs> he, he was so entertaining, sleeping on the kitchen counter, and all that. And for going way back. Pat and of course Dave were part of Nirvana, and then they went yeah. on to the to the Foo Fighters. Uh, the germs. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so besides Dave and Pat, was there anyone that really needed help on how they got nervous being in front of the camera that you really had to step in and sort of coach and guide them? 
No, I mean, the guys are pretty comfortable. They've been in front of the cameras for a long time. They've been doing that. You know, Nate, because Nate had a really big part in this movie, like really big. Yeah. And there was times where I'd have to like, like, there, it's funny because there's this moment in the movie where they're like talking about what they're going to do. And I did these, these like push-ins on Pat where he's like, he asked the question, what are we going to do? And we do this like, like super heroic push-in on Nate where he goes, we go save his ass. <laughs> you know, and it was funny because Nate absolutely was like, dude, that feels so cheesy when I do that line. I'm like, it's the point, but it's like this heroic moment. You know what I mean? So I had to kind of be like, no, trust me. You're like when you see this moment in the film, you're going to love it. There's like moments like that with everybody. Like they're like, is that yeah. okay? I'm like, oh yeah, no, it's going to be, it's going to be awesome. Now, um, now you, I would, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut I you. Saying, I would throw like, like when we were doing like scenes and things, if there were certain things, if I felt like energy was being lost as any director would do, you know, I would start throwing out things like, Pat, you got to stay like this, man. You just saw a bunch of demons. And, and like, cause Pat would be like, Oh, those demons. And I'd be like, no, Pat, like those things are scary. You have to be like those demons right there, those demons. And so he's like, oh, okay. And then he just would be like, those de-. And like, he would start yelling and doing that stuff. There was like moments like that where you just had to make sure that they were, they were having their, their, uh, the, the way they, sh- they would act if you saw demons. Or, to like, be in scary. the moment. Yeah. To be in yeah, that moment. moment. Now your movies directing, you're notoriously known for your bloody, but lighthearted uh, gore, okay? And Studio 666 does not lack any of that. Uh, yeah. You had some amazing kill scenes in there. Uh, was it a collaborative effort to come up with those kill scenes? Was it written into the script? Was it something that you came up with on set? No, those kill scenes were always kind of like talked about. And those were those were the kill scenes that went into the script. Because Tony Gardner, who did the... He, he worked with Dave on the run videos. He does all, a lot of stuff for Dave. And he also does all the Slayer things for me. And like, mm-hmm. I've worked with him on other film sets, like on Zombieland. And I mean, he's done everything from, you know, even the Blob remake, which is, I love it. Um, he uh, basically said, hey, Tony, out of all the movies you've done, um, what would you like to do personally as a kill scene? Like, what kind of kills do you want to see in the movie, like in, in this movie? And so he's like, oh, okay. So he wrote down all these like different things that he always has wanted to do, but was never you know he just always gets a script and goes oh we're doing that yeah so we let tony kind of take the reins of like coming up with ideas because it's his shop and it would be fun for him to actually be creative and we just took what he his ideas and we put him in the script of how each character was going to die because tony wanted to do that kind of kill you know so we let him have his dream it was creative i mean all of them were creative but my favorite bar none is the bedroom chainsaw one uh, oh yeah, I think everybody's love. Everybody loves that one. <laughs> that was very elaborate. Uh, walk us through shooting that. Uh, that must have taken at least a six hours to a full day worth of shooting to try to get that you know done accurately. Well, so yeah, it's funny because so the 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 room that they're in that Whitney and Rami's in is actually a, a guest house uh, on that property. And you see it when the guys are eating barbecue and stuff. You'll see this little guest house. Mm-hmm. We never kind of. We never explained that's where Rami was, but he, you hear him say, I get the guest house. So anyways, we actually shot in the guest house and, you know, we were like, okay, we'll start the scene in here. But it's like, we kept going back and forth. Like how nasty is it going to get in this place? How are we going to contain what we're about to do? And because we, we planned on trying to beat nightmare on Elm street one's Johnny Depp scene, Mm -hmm. the the amount of that kind of blood. Um, and we were like, well, if we're going to do that and we shoot in this room, we're going to completely destroy this guest house. Like, it's going to be destroyed. So we shot the very beginning of that scene in the guest house. And then we had to build an actual three-wall set, like like a to size. Yeah, replica. Out in the parking lot mm-hmm. because we knew that, you know, it was going to get trashed. And that's what we did. We we finished, We did the, the rest of it. We did all the scene all the way up until that that moment. And that moment we shot out on in the parking lot in a in a set that we could completely obliterate. And obviously what was used, did you use like full body casting for the two actors? And mm-hmm. I don't want to ruin the scene, but when you guys watch this scene, you'll know exactly, you're going to love it. When it comes to the supporting cast with uh, Whitney uh, Cummings as Samantha and Leslie Grossman as Barb, who you probably met on the set of American Horror Story, that's uh, why I cast her, yeah. Yeah, she's great. Was it hard to put together the supporting cast, or did it all fall into place? It all kind of fell into place because it was a lot of people that Dave knew and it was a lot of people that I knew. And so when we were going through, like, all right, who should we get? So obviously Whitney Cummings is going to be great as Samantha. 
you know, and, and Dave and Whitney have, have been friends. So we just reached out and she's like, yeah, I'll do it. And it's me. Awesome. And we, and she was great to have Leslie. I worked with an American horror story. And I just always, every time we read that part, I saw her because the season I did of that, I, she was like, kind of like the comedic relief. Yeah. Uh, I did the doomsday bunker one. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, I always thought she was really funny, but she's like, she was perfect to play that part. Garland, I, that came from Dave, I believe. Um, Jenna Ortega, you know, we, I, so the movie opens very dark, right? And I'll say that. And cause I, did, I didn't want everybody, when people turn the movie on go, oh, it's the Foo Fighters movie, it's fun. Yeah. I wanted people to go, wait a minute, what the hell is this? What, what about I just get into? Mm -hmm. And I go, all right, we need a really strong uh, opening female, like, really good actress yeah so we talked to wendy our, our casting agent and she sent a bunch of audition tapes and i went through a bunch and a bunch me and my wife sat and just watched 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 and then we see jenna on you and we see this performance and i'm like that's her we need we need to get her she's fantastic like she would be perfect for this role she Reached was she was she right on in yeah i mean honestly i wish had i known what's going on i wish she had a bigger part <laughs> <laughs> and kudos and, for that opener by the way that is a scary opener and you're like, it's oh, my bad. God, our, this is going to be scary. So I like how it went to that. And then it sort of blends into present day Foo Fighters and yep. it rolls uh, from there. Now, the plot of the story, Dave Grohl has creator's block. They want to do their 10th album. And to find inspiration, he asks his manager to find him a place, a house that's going to spark inspiration. And that's what sort of it rolls downhill from, from there for them. Uh, do you know, did Dave ever say, I'm sure being in the music business for as long as he has, that he drew on real life inspiration for this story? Not the demonic part, but the writer's it's blog. Definitely the demonic part. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, no. He didn't really say anything like this is how that like, you know, that, like this is what really happens. It wasn't like really any, he never really mentioned that. If, if that's the case, then I don't know. But I mean, look, we all know that everybody, band members, writers, directors, everybody has writer's block or yeah. like, you get that no matter what. I, I was in a punk band for five years of my life in my, you know, early, you know, my late teens, early 20s. And I know how that was, would roll through. You'd be like, oh, man, we're trying to write these songs. It doesn't really, it's not that good. You know, we went through a stint where we made all this, this album. It was like the worst thing ever. Uh, it was like our second thing that we were doing. It was, and it was crazy. And then we finally kind of came back. And it, anyways, that's another story. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, I mean, I, the thing is what you see on screen with what a band goes through, I yeah. think translates on any level. I think that's also another reason why I, I like really feel like I did a good job with it because not only am I a director and work in films, but I did come from music. I came from yeah. punk rock. I, I toured with a band for six years. I, I recorded in, in, in studios. I, uh, you know, did the whole thing where you argue with your bandmates and, and, you know, you get into those things. So it's kind of neat to see that, dynamic with the guys because no one ever does and it is you know kind of true to form of how really things are in a band and that puts you in a unique perspective and i want to ask you this uh having been in the recording world music world and also in the uh movie world i hear that the music industry is actually way more cutthroat than the film television business would you agree with that I think it's harder to succeed as a musician, especially nowadays with the internet and how accessible it is to get your music. If you're a band, you're trying to make money, you know, like, and you, and you, you know, we just have this album. Well, it takes somebody to rip it, start sending it off to yeah. people you know, doing that. I, mean, I still pay iTunes. I still buy albums constantly because I just, I support it. Yeah. I've been there to support all that. Um, yeah, I when I was in my old band, there we didn't have the internet. I'm just I'm showing how old I am. But like it was like punk rock zines, like maximum rock and roll, and like like these zines would come out or compilations that would come out, lookout records, you know, or like or like fat records with you know, epitaph doing these comps. And your main money source would be touring, you know, which I think nowadays that's also a thing where people make most bands I think still to this day make their money touring. Exactly. Merchandise, you know, sales and all that. Because I don't know how much I don't know how it is nowadays, but with the internet, I mean, I don't know how much people get off albums anymore. I think it's really based on selling out auditoriums and touring. You I'll, know? I'll tell you, I'll share a little story with you that my lawyer, who's an entertainment lawyer, told me he doesn't even take music clients because the what we would call the distribution business in the movies and TV, it is just so, he used the word sleazy. 
Yeah. It's, it's a, I mean, yeah, that's, that's yeah. his, that's his word. He used the word sleazy. He doesn't even take yeah. music uh, uh, clients because right. it, they take most of the money. And that's why bands, like you said, might make the majority of their money touring. And yeah. the more successful you are, the more people you bring in, the more money you make. Now, the the bulk of your career, we talked about this the last time you were on. I mean, you are like a primo camera operator, Steadcam, the whole nine yards. Um, do you have any thoughts? Uh, if you would like to, uh, would you prefer to switch over to directing full time? Yeah, I mean, that's always the dream. That's what I moved to L.A. for, you know, is to always direct. I just happened to go on a different path, you know, because I found camera operating very uh, special. I, I found it very unique. I fell in love with the craft. I fell in love with the fact that whatever I'm doing and what my eye sees and the control I have of the camera is what the viewer is going to see on, on, on screen. Yeah. I fell in love with it. Steady cam. I fell in love with, with the tool that, to make those shots and then onto the cranes and all that. I'm, I'm a huge – I still love camera operating. You know, I still yeah. do camera operating. I'm two decades in, you know what I mean? Like I'm in a union and I want those retirement hours. I got to keep, <laughs> keep going. <laughs> However, uh, you know, if things totally took off as, and, and, and it was full-time directing, of course, you know, that's like, that's, that's the main goal. But you know, I'm, I'm totally happy doing anything on a film set, like with what I've accomplished, like either directing or camera operating. I enjoy both. And, They're both different, but oh, I yeah. enjoy them still to this day. And to your camera operating work, I mean, you are in like blockbusters. Let's see, since you've been, the last time you've been on, which was last summer, The Conjuring 3 has come out, Malignant. Mm -hmm. You, I know that you and James Wan, you mentioned last time, are really good friends. He's a dude. Uh, and also uh, Maverick, which is finally coming out this summer. I've been waiting for that movie for so long. And uh, you're in the middle of, of uh filming according to imdb salem's lot is if you can I'm say done, done. We, we we wrapped okay you wrapped on that <laughs> i'm home this is, i'm at my house yeah, okay. we shot that in massachusetts no uh, I'm, I'm, i could uh... tell all the cool stuff you have in the background <laughs> uh, can you say if that salem's lot is a reboot or a continuation are you allowed to say or no no, it's, I mean, it is Salem's Lot. It's It's the story. It's, it's the what, story. Okay. I can see that. I can't really go. I can't tell any more yeah, detail. No, I, don't, that, I, don't, yeah, I don't expect anymore. I think anymore. that Gary Dauberman, though, he's, he did a stellar job on what's, what people are going to see. Uh, the stuff that we did is really awesome. So I'm... I, th I think this this is going to be, I think it's going to blow people's minds. Oh, I bet it is. I bet it is. So, I mean, experiencing both worlds of independent filmmaking as a director, and then you working on these big studio films like Maverick, The Conjuring, Malignant, working with these other great directors. Is it really completely two different worlds uh, where the actors, the crew that work on these big budgets as opposed to these independent filmmakers? Is it really two completely separate worlds? It just really comes down to the tools that you get and, and how much time you have to shoot a movie. I mean, that's the thing, like a small movie like Studio 666, we didn't have a lot of time to shoot it. You get these other big movies, you get 70 days to 100 day shooting schedules yeah. that are like massive. You know, and money's no no object. You, you get the crane you want every single day. You know, or you know, like where I would sit there and go, "Can I please get a techno crane for one day?" And they're like, "No, you can get this really crappy crane." So try to make it work. And you're like, "I guess I'm going to make it work." Um, you know, it's it's just different in that way. Like where you you get a lot of the, the toys, you get more time when you're on bigger budget movies. The smaller ones, which I think is kind of cool, if you come up like how I kind of came up is I, ha I came up from the indie films, I came up from the smaller movies, and I learned how to make things work, how to manage your time and how to like, because you don't have time, you got to figure it out on the fly. Yeah. And, and you can't sit there and go, well, what are you going to do? No, it's like, you actually have to be like, okay, what's what, what do you want to do? Oh, we're going to do it this way. Give me this, give me that, give yeah. it boom, boom, boom. Because no one's going to wait on you. And that's like the biggest difference is coming up from the indie world and learning that kind of stuff, I think makes you a better filmmaker just because you've experienced like being in like the gnarly trenches. Mm -hmm. And then when you get to the bigger budget movies, you're now like in the, you're in the captain's quarters of an aircraft carrier being like, ha ha, you know, <laughs> not that I'm staring at the war and I've never been in the captain's. That's yeah. just a terrible comparison probably. But um, you know, that's really what it is. You're it's, it's hard. The indie films are much harder, but you, 
you gain how to make things work. Exactly. You, know, you really have to really think about it. Exactly. Instead of walking on a giant set and going, oh, we're doing that. Okay, great. Here's our techno crane. Here's our <laughs> this and that. Here's all these guns with cool ammo that like, you know, like on Hatchet 3, I, like we were counting bullets because we couldn't <laughs> afford it. Like, I'm not kidding. We were counting bullets. Like, wow. uh-oh, about to run out. Jeez. Uh, so man we're already at 30 minutes so like we talked about <laughs> studio good. 666 is available in theaters exclusively do we have any idea of when it's going to hit a uh, video on demand blu-ray and so on blu-ray will be down the road um video on demand is i think will probably be i mean i i don't know the exact date but i feel like it's going to come out like probably in a month or two like okay. I mean, it's, kind of, it's kind of like the average thing like when you see a movie come in i mean look our movie probably was never supposed to go to theaters yeah very happy that it did it's really cool that people went out to go see it and i'm, I'm I, I think everybody that did um but yeah i think when it comes to bod and people can see it it's going to be really fun and it, is. it is it yeah. is and guys i cannot recommend this movie to you enough uh i i like a good horror comedy but this is more than that it's not like you're going to sit there laughing it's a entertaining movie that's the best word i can use it's very entertaining in the humor in the gore and the blood and the circumstances that people are placed in it's a must watch bj i want to thank you so much for coming back and sharing the experience of, of studio 666 it's great you did a great job as always any final thank thoughts you. you want to share before we go support indie horror film get out there and see all this all the movies the smaller films go see them go go support them you know because they don't get enough love we don't have the kind of big huge marketing campaigns and the giant billboards like you know it's we we're lucky to get what we, what we got for our movie but you know i say that generally for all people and all filmmakers making these movies that are that that are smaller budget and harder yeah. to make support Absolutely. them you know that's what that's why we get diverse movies that's why we get different you know free thinking things please support, support absolutely them. absolutely you know? i can i i agree with you 100 percent, guys thank you so much for tuning in live and those of you who are watching later on again a big thank you to our guest bj mcdonald the movie's called studio 666 it's out in theaters now if you're looking to go to the theater this is what you got to watch right now thank you again to bj till next thank time you. guys on behalf of bj and myself stay safe Stay walking. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you.